Hello and welcome to Straight Shooting with Dan and Joseph. Tune into this podcast to get the latest news on competitive shooting events and to learn how to become a better shooter. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and be sure to recommend it to all of your shooting friends. Hello and welcome to episode seven of Straight Shooting with Dan and Joseph. We're here with you today. Got Blake Lyles back from 415 Training. Thanks for coming back over, Blake. Thanks for having me back. Got a good show coming up for you today. Today, we don't have any score updates as we're still in the middle of the COVID uh, pandemic. Things are starting to open up, so we do have some rescheduled dates to go over for you and actually got a few matches we can start looking forward to in May, hopefully. We'll come with our straight shooting challenge, talk a little bit about the uh, four for core drill. We've been working on that a little bit today. Blake gave us some pointers. We're going to talk about that. And then when we come down to the next episode or in the next segment, we've got the NRL 22 base class and ARA factory class. And I'm, I'm building a rifle that should work in both of those. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, what we're doing with that, and get some, uh, give you some tips that I've f- figured out about that. We'll finish off with bleeding off with Joseph as Blake's here from 415 Training. Going to go over the four for core drill and then the four for core drill with movement. Correct and go over that drill and give some tips and pointers on that. Okay, moving right along the match update. Like I said, not too many matches going on around the country, but we have big news or good news in the Rimfire bench rest world. The Triple Crown of Rimfire is a go for Memorial Day weekend, and it's actually they're still doing every event, so it's actually going to be seven, eight, eight days of shooting if, wow. you, if you want to now. Um, each day is a one-day event, so you can go for one, except for the Triple Crown, which is the Saturday and Sunday. So that's a two-day event. But all the other ones are one-day events. Starts on May 16th in Bristol, Tennessee, Kettlefield Gun Club. So May 16th is a Saturday. They're going to have uh, ABRA, the Auto Bench Rest Association State Tournament, on that Saturday. And then on Sunday, American Rim Fire Association ARA uh, Club Tournament. And then on Monday... Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is all our 50-50 rimfire bench rest. They're going to have the state uh, on Monday, the 18th, state and mid-Atlantic meters competition in the unlimited division. And then the next day, it's the same state and mid-Atlantic uh, unlimited in yards. And then on Wednesday, the state and mid-Atlantic 10-shot. So they're doing their little 10-shot competition. Then on Thursday, we'll be there, be running the Professional Shooting League, PSL, our whole shot arms bench rest brawl that'll be on that uh, Thursday the 21st Friday the 22nd will be the ARA state tournament and then Saturday and Sunday will be the triple crown of rimfire which on Saturday will shoot three ARA targets and then three PSL and then we'll come back on Sunday and shoot 350 so come on out if you can uh, we understand a lot of people different situations a lot of people itching to get out because but uh, but Tennessee has opened back up by then Virginia will probably even be open back up uh, they've got a June 10th open date but Bristol's right on the line and Virginia governor's kind of uh, crawfishing a little bit and maybe gonna go ahead and open that back up also, the Ely Rocky Mountain Regional NRL 22 match that was rescheduled from April in Utah is now set for June 27th, 2020. So Joseph and I will both be out there for that and looking forward to going out there um, right just south of Salt Lake And that City. is, uh, that's Jim's Yep, match. that's the one Jim Cannon yep. is going to be running. Um, originally, they had over 100 signed up, so it's going to be a really big a regional match there. We'll see how many people are able to carry over and make it there. But I think I would imagine the folks out around there are about like us. They're ready to do something. So looking forward to that. Uh, as far as USPSA, mm-hmm. I think May 10th, Brazos Land in Navasota, Texas. And then the uh, River City is on the yep. 23rd. Yes. May 23rd down so, in San yeah. Antonio. So take a look at the USPSA and practice score. I'm sure in your area there may be some matches popping up. but uh, Yeah, and these are their level ones, which are basically their like, local matches. They have them once a month. Uh, River City works out for me because I was originally going to go last month mm-hmm. anyway, and then it got rescheduled to the, to the 23rd. Um, so that works out I'm, for I'm me. I'm shooting that one, yeah. River City. Okay. All right. Good deal. Are you squatted? What are you shooting? I'm not squatted yet. I just <laughs> found it today. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't been looking. Okay. Fair so, enough. 
So anyway, there's our updates uh, on the match updates. If Again, if you want us to mention any of your matches or got a big match coming up, want us to talk about it, uh, we'll be happy to help you get it promoted. Uh, email us at host at straightshootingwithdanandjoseph.com. All right, moving right along the straight shooting challenge. Uh, be sure and send us your videos. Uh, we'll get this video posted on our YouTube channel. Go look for that straight shooting podcast on YouTube. And uh, today was good because we had Blake there and was able to really help me for sure uh, point out a few major things. And I just realized that I haven't been videoing myself. If I, if I, and I don't know if I would notice uh, those things I was doing wrong anyway be, me being new but how important it is to video yourself to point out a couple of things but blake really helped me out a lot there or at least some type of uh keeping track of something whether that's based like because you can keep track of a lot of it based on your time so the data you get off the timer um so if you're not timing yourself i would really recommend that whether it's dry fire or live fire either one because there's, there's a lot of little micro movements that you need to be keeping track of because then you don't have anything to go off of if you don't yeah. know where you're at um but video also helps and that's something that uh a lot of the veteran guys like at the matches that i've been to when they video it's way different than like if me and you were videoing because mm -hmm. you know in our mind we're thinking you know we need to get the target blah 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 on theirs it's literally just whoever is shooting you know target doesn't really matter what you shot because that's not the whole purpose well, of that. Well, you'll know what it is. You can yeah, the shooter sword. will, but like, you know, whoever's watching it, that's kind of just like a silver lining is they see the speed, so right. you could have missed every target. They're not going to know the difference, um, but well, that's not going to help you. <laughs> there's kind of two thought processes on, on a video, and I think we talked about this a little last time, you know, for entertainment value or for critiquing yourself yep. value and that should be the first should be uh, priority. Hopefully. Mine starts off critiquing and usually turns out to be entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> but well, like coming in, it's kind of a novelty thing for new shooters because yeah. I was the same way. Sure. Like, you know, I, I probably look so cool doing this, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to video it just to show people. Like, I may be showing a ton of better shooters than me how bad I am, but – the rest of the population, they're not going to know the difference, so it just looks cool. Yeah. I don't know. I look like a big, slow <laughs> gorilla, I think, coming around out there. I'm like, man, in my mind, I'm a lot faster, <laughs> leaner, meaner. I don't know. It just looks totally different. But Blake pointed something out with me that's already helped me with my draw, how I kept bringing my muzzle Yep. I was kind of doing the Starsky and Hutch is what yeah. I think of, where he's just kind of flipping it out there well, he and bringing it that my muzzle down the, uh, rather than coming up. And, man, it, that already, it just in the 10 practice draws I was able to do, has helped me pick up that mm -hmm. dot. So and that's, that's something he had to fix with me also. And I think you called it, like, the lethal weapon or the, the policeman or something. Charlie's just Angels. Whenever you're holding it oh, like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, Instead of, you know, out and ready. yeah. I think of Charlie, well, Charlie's Angels. There, yeah. I mean, we all learn from somewhere. I know the very first match I went to is Abilene Indoor Gun Range. Never been to one before, and guy kind of pulled me aside. So, so here's some of our basic rules, and this and that, and this and that. And then I said, okay, cool, cool. And they had a stage where it's all indoors, so you have to everything has to go directly down range. And they had like a little wall set up, and you had to shoot on one side, then run around that wall and shoot the other side. And so I said, okay. So I went bang, 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 and I pulled my gun up like this, like a cop, which. The 180 rule applies left and right and also top and bottom. Good. And it wasn't a 180, but it was 179.2, you <laughs> know. And it's like, so just so you know, right. we all learn. Try to learn. Hopefully learn. Well, tune in to that, and you'll see Joseph and I going through there. I think I hadn't figured up our hit factor, but you probably beat me. Uh, I, I had know. more alphas, but, uh, but yours was a lot faster. And as we calculated last time, as long as you still got a Charlie, that yeah. that's – don't want any deltas, don't want any mics, but on a lower in, a, in an open, in open, an alpha or a Charlie, is a Charlie's not going to hurt you that Absolutely. that very little. So and that's kind of how, um, whenever I'm imagining thing, because it's easy to get it in the mindset. Same thing whenever you're like pre-planning your stage run before you actually run it. In your head, you're going to do everything perfectly, mm -hmm. and so you're going to get 
however many shots there are, you're going to get that many alphas, and you're going to do it in five seconds, when realistically, you're going to have two or three Charlies, probably, and your time is not going to be whatever you just imagined in your little pre-stage plan. Um, so you want me to visualize my misses? Well, I I purposely <laughs> throw like I'm just two or three Charlies in there because I know, and I mean, if it's a super easy, like close frame target, maybe if I slow down, I'll get all alphas, have, have a clean stage. But I'll usually allot myself one or two Charlies, depending on however many rounds. If it's a 30-round stage, I'll probably throw like four or five in there. Yeah. Um, just because I... I try to keep myself from getting into that, like, I'm going to do everything perfect mindset. Because it's the same way whenever, when I first started, and that's, I think it's something that a lot of new shooters do. Whenever you're in your little pre-stage planning session, right before you're about to go, whenever it's your turn, you come up, you get everything ready. Well, there may be five targets, and they're going, yeah, you just went through all five in about half a second when... In reality, it's going to take you five seconds to go from here to here to here to here, whether it's two shots, whatever. And so to keep out from getting to that mentality, I try to be not perfect in my own mind because yeah. I know I'm not going to be in reality. Uh, so that's what I try to do. All right, so send us in a, an email to host at Straight Shooting with Dan and Joseph with your ideas on what we should do. Uh, Mark had sent one over about the... Uh, Draw, shoot, drop the mag, or reload, and shoot one more, and had the video of the guy doing it in, like, I don't know. Oh, yeah, fast. I don't remember who that guy was, but. I'll bring it up. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to try and play with it. I mean, it was like. His reload was, there. his split, like, you couldn't even tell that he reloaded between the shots. Wow. It was crazy fast. They And they slow-moed it down, so he's dropping the mag, and as the mags, I mean, the mag, they almost run into one another. As he's bringing up his mag, I mean, that dude was like. I don't remember. Major fast. Guy. I'm sure he's probably done it 10,000 times. But There's a video out there when Travis Tomasi was on the uh, AMU, and he was actually still on the AMU team of him doing his kind of dry fire reloads. They're pretty dumb. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really, you know, he's dropping this mag, and this mag is right about here as yep. this mag is just coming out of the gun, and they just they pass each other right yeah. there. Yes. It's just belligerently cool. There's to watch only that, man. space yeah. to go in. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so email us, ho uh, host at Straight Shooting with Dan and Joseph. Yep. All right, moving right along. Precision Shots brought to you by Kello Shooting Sports, your one-stop shop for competition shooting needs. All right, we've been talking about NRL 22 base class. ARA, American Rimfire Association, also has the new factory class. I want to do both. So I'm trying to set up a rifle okay. where we'll work in both. And actually, I, I think it's going to work fantastic. So the uh, NRL base class, their rules uh, is the rifle and the scope, the MSRP total has to be 1,050 or under. We'll take the MSRP. They also say it has to be currently in production, which is um, so all of your older rifles are out. It's got to be. Now, you can use those in open, but you just can't use them in the base class. So uh, what a lot of guys do is um, talking with Jim Cannon in our last episode, the Tika T1X is real popular, and the CZ457 is real popular. And match that up with an Athlon scope. Athlon scopes are reasonably priced, but seem to have really good quality. So what we're doing is I'm teaming up. It's a pretty so tight budget. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. It is. For a, For a rifle and a scope. Yeah. Um, and, but that's what, honestly, the Athlon scopes, some things are nice. Yeah. I mean, and they're... They, and they're, they're For that specific category like having wanting a quality scope and having to come in under this price that's like the perfect yep product because they so i'm looking at the athlon argos btr that's uh bravo tango romeo btr gen 2 um and there's two basically that'll work um there's a 6 to 24 by 50 and that's 450 msrp and then uh, that gets me well within um by the time you add the Tika or the CZ. And then the because I'm going to be using it for bench rest, though, I think I'm going to go ahead and go with the 8 to 34 by 56, and it's 499 So 
that and either the CZ or the T could come right under that 1,050. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm putting on. I'm putting on the Athlon Argos BTR Gen 2, 8 to 34 by 56. And basically... Does that... I, uh, I know they have a 10 by 40. Does yeah, that one... That one gets it, it out over. Of that price? Yeah, it, okay. Uh, and uh, it's just barely over. But, okay. and I was worried... And I don't know, me being inexperienced on the NRL 22, some of them they have that. I don't know if 10 is going to be too oh, much. Because for they a do shorter some, range. Yeah, for yeah. a shorter range. So I'm going to – hopefully 8 will be okay. I mean, mo I know a lot of them do 6 to 24, so mm -hmm. I just was worried. I was, I'm was. i hoping that 6 to 8 is not that big a deal, but I know 24 to 36 is going to be a big deal yeah. on the uh, – or 26 to – I mean, 24 to 34. For the ARA. Yeah, because yeah. normally on my bench gun for ARA, I've got a 36 power. So 34 power, that will be – That'll be good enough, especially on the factory class. Factory class bull is quite a bit bigger, so it uh, works just fine. And, and I shot it yesterday evening, so, I mean, it, it 34 is going to work just fine on that. So I'm setting up both the T1X and the CZ457 varmint, and I'm trying to decide which I want to go with. Luckily, with us being like we're able to, I'm able to set up both, and yeah. I'm going to try both and shoot both. And a couple of things that are kind of persuading me, um, the Tika comes with a muzzle already threaded for a suppressor. Now, I don't have a suppressor. I wouldn't mind getting one, but I don't I don't if have you don't one. Already have one. That's yeah. yeah, so I mean that's kinda for me it's not that big of an advantage. Now some people that may be all the difference in the world. Um, the the four fifty seven has a heavier barrel, the varmint does. Um you can get the American, 457 American, but that one, um, anyway, I just, I like the heavier barrel. Yeah. So, in the the Tika starts off 0 .870 and goes down to 0 .728 at the muzzle, and the 457 Varmin is at .860, so it's an 860 straight, the full length. I personally like that. Uh, you can feel it. I mean, it, it's, it's a little heavier. It's obviously heavier. Yep. The other thing is the... The varmint has the wood stock, mm -hmm. which I like the way it looks. Yeah. I like the wood stock better. Um, the Tika has the plastic stock or whatever you want to composite. composite. Composite, good fancy word for plastic. Yeah. But <laughs> but in this particular thing, the, the composite stock is probably going to be the better deal because yeah. – when you're laying on a barricade or putting it on everything, I, you're going to scratch that wood stock all to pieces. Yep. Or As, chip it. Or chip it or something. So that's kind of leaning me a little more towards the... Um, and it's lighter. Tinker. Yeah, so, it is a little lighter. I mean, we like the heavier one, but, you know, if that's your whole thing, if you're going to be moving a lot in the NRL, then it is lighter, so yep. it'll be a lot easier to, to lug around. Uh, now, both of them, I'm putting the... EGW, the Evolution Gun Works, uh, 20 MOA base on there. They both go on there real simple and easy, and uh, that converts it over to where I can use a Weaver style or Picatinny style ring, and I'm putting the uh, Burr Signature Z rings. I've always liked the Burr rings. They're the one, the Signature Z have the um, inserts in them. Mm -hmm. I like the inserts because, one, they hold well, and two, they don't mark the scope. If you ever take yeah. that scope back off, it there's no ring marks. And every the, other the ring I've ever plastic. used. The rings are metal, but the inserts are plastic. Right. And so they don't mark it up. The other thing is, now I'm not going to need it for NRL 22 because that's just to 100 yards. But if we ever start doing some of the ELR, extreme long range, or anything out farther, those inserts come and they can give you some 10 more MOA Mm. Uh, in those, they've got off. They've got different size inserts in order to, so you can get some more. You might be able to get 20 MOA actually, because they have a minus 10. I think it's a, a plus 10, 10 and a 20, and it goes both ways. Anyway, maybe. I can get. You can definitely get more. So if I need it, I can flip those around. Uh, I have the zeros in there now, which means there's there is straight ahead. There's no MOA built into that. Then I put a bipod on them. Um, and my plan is I'll take the bi – because the bipod just clips on – or not clips, it tightens down onto the swivel stud on the front. Mm -hmm. When I go to do the bench rest, I'm just going to pull it off, um, and it'll ride the bag. It's super easy to put on and off. And I, based on Jim Cannon's recommendation, I went with that Harris Ultralight Bipod Series S in the 6 to 9-inch. I'm going to go with that. 
Still haven't got me a rear bag yet, so I'm looking for recommendations for the rear bag for the NRL 22. Uh, send those to the host at Straight Shooting with Dan and Joseph .com. Trying to figure out what I want on that. So then when I go to the bench or the factory class, probably just going to go ahead and go with that Caldwell front rest. Um, it works. It doesn't have yes. a lot of uh, give. I mean, it's it's a a set shape and size and you can't really change that right. um but i know a lot of guys will just use those little s stuff sacks that they just fill with sand yep. and you can drape them around something or fold them if you need it taller or kind of squash it down if you need it lower um but we'll just if you've got one that you use or one that you would recommend to somebody just let us know all right, and then both of them, I'm feeding the, the new Ely semi-auto bench rest uh, precision. Um, that stuff works really good in any magazine-fed uh, rifle. They've got it's got the round nose, got a little thinner lube made for a semi-auto, but really works well just on any magazine-fed rifle. So with these bolt-action rifles, it shoots shoots good in both of them. So I'm still playing with them. I'm going to shoot both of them in a match, uh, NRL 22 as well as. Uh, ARA factory class, try to see and try to work out um, what I personally like better. Uh, right now, the feel of them and shooting both of them, they're, they're both close. good. Yeah. I like them. They got, I mean, the triggers are, could probably use a little work, but I mean, I don't know. We're kind of spoiled. I'm used to my bench rest trigger with a two ounce, so it's, it's different. And so I'm just getting used to both of them. But anyway, email me in or, or, Tag us on Facebook or something, and uh, let me know your thoughts. Tika T1X versus the 457, or maybe there's another base class rifle out there that I'm totally missing. Uh, we've also got a Savage over there that uh, B22 that I really like the trigger on it. It's got the Accu mm -hmm. trigger on it. Uh, I may play around a little bit with it as well, trying to see which of the one I'm a little bit of an accuracy nuff, a buff or nut, and so I'm that's that one, one just I'm, the style of it. It looks like it would work perfect as an NRL rifle. On the, on the, on the Savage? Yeah. I'm not sure on the bench rest. It just yeah, the bench it looks like a tactical style rifle. Yeah. The, it makes it a little more difficult with the butt of that to get on a rear bag mm -hmm. when you're doing a doing a two-piece setup on a bench rest application. So I have to kind of work that out. But anyway, email us, host at Straight Shooting with Dan and Joseph. All right, moving on to our main thing for today, bleeding off with Joseph. Uh, Joseph's got Blake Lyles back in, 415 training, and talking about the four for core drill, and then we've got another one for this month, or this episode. What's the new one? Four for core with, with movement. movement. With movement. Yeah, and that's kind of the trend. So I'm just calling this the evolution of, like, a new – shooter or a rookie shooter and sort of the trend is same if you go to Blake's class or whoever's class uh, some sort of trainer you start off with your fundamentals which is what this drill really tries to get you to work on that's why we call it the four for core yeah four for core core fundamentals being the the main key point that you're working on but then as you progress you're just compounding and that word is just pounded into my head compounding because that's <laughs> all you're doing once you start shooting this sport that's all you ever do is you just start adding more things on to that base that the yeah. core and so this is a great drill and that's basically what the movement is is you're compounding things on top of that so you've got your four things that you're working on initially and you can drill that until you run out of ammo or your gun explodes or stops <laughs> running. I mean, you can drill that until the end of time. And then when you're ready, or even when you're not ready, whenever you want to, start compounding this next movement. And so it just adds something else to work on. So okay. uh, in a perfect world, you would perfect those core fundamentals before you move it on to the next one. That's not really how it works because – how do you know? For me. <laughs> yeah, how do you how do you know that you've perfected it? Or once you add this little small micro transition or small movement, your fundamentals kind of go out the window because yeah. everybody reverts back. And so this is just compounding those things. So it's giving you more things you have to think about, more things that you have to work on, 
and it kind of shifts your focus from those fundamental base things to now these new things that you probably weren't thinking about before that you need to work on and now you are because it's hitting you in the face yes. once you try to do it okay um, quick question for blake remind me the core that we want to core with. is stance draw grip trigger got it. we do those four things as best we can no matter what we're doing movement standing still on our head whatever okay. All right, so I'm working on those four for core with yep. four for core drill with movement. Yep. yep. All right, so tell me about that drill break, Blake. Break. So, <laughs> uh, we we tried to keep. Okay, nobody ever calls me Blake. It's always <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> we tried to keep the setup as as similar as we could. So the setup is basically the same, uh, from center line, four yards up, four yards to the left, a target, ten yards up, four yards to the right, a target, and then. The last drill was a box in the center. This one now has two boxes, one yard off to the right, one yard off to the left from center. And the movement is just uh, from the left box, engage with two rounds, the target directly ahead of you, change boxes, shoot the target from the right target from the right box with two rounds, and then repeat going the other direction. And it's it's pretty typical of what we do at any match. We're always moving from position to position to position. And just moving in and out of those positions effectively is the key of really shaving off pretty big chunks of time. Yep. And like you saw, so, yeah, it sounds pretty simple. It's, oh, it's the same drill. You're just going from position A to position B. It's only two steps. No big deal. Yeah. But or for you, it's one step. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But as you're doing it, you realize, okay, they're just within this seemingly simple movement, I have to work on my exit and my entry, entry foot, lead foot, exit foot, you know, everything, an easy entry, hard exit. Easy Somewhere exit, in the line, you still entry, have yeah. to have to be visible of the gun, keep the gun up and start shooting yep. back on it again, which is we found, you know, is, is, is still challenging because all those things, as we said, there's seven or eight or ten things happening inside of four seconds, mm -hmm. and, and they're all pretty critical to completing that drill well and that's that's kind of what i like about the the training aspect in general is because you can you can lay it out for me kind of like taking a test you know in a classroom or whatever you can see it on paper and your orientation on what you need to do could be pretty close or it could be extremely far off from like the correct way to do it that mm -hmm. You know, you just don't realize that, that that's a better way of doing it until you see it done. And so that's kind of what you'll see. That's most of what you'll see on the video is you'll see me and you do it, and then you'll see the correct way to do it or, you know, a more efficient way. I don't want to say correct or yeah. wrong. Right or wrong, it's it's more efficient. Yeah. Um, so whether that's faster or it's it's a way to make up more points with less time, it's just it's a it's a more efficient way and you're going to perform better if you can recreate that or if you are coachable and, and take those points uh, and work on them. Is yeah. that about right? That's about right. Cool. Yeah. It's a good little drill. Yeah, and it's... The uh, original drill is really good for transitions while you're still focusing on those core things. This one, you start compounding those four core things with exits and entries into positions. So going from, like, the regular base... Uh, core for four drill if you had a student so say either dan or i are we can both be students whatever um we've already ran that drill so we're at we're at one of your classes probably level one or whatever um we're at the class and we're just moving on to the next thing so would you set it up and say okay you know how would you do this or would you just lay it in front of us and say run this how how you think? Usually, if we're into the coaching aspect of it, a lot of times we may start off with like a stage and then let them kind of run it the way they want to, and then we can talk about what we mm -hmm. could do better, could do worse. But usually, once we're into the actual instruction part of it, I'll kind of give you the the rundown of the proper ways to do it. I'll try to demo it. I'll try to answer any questions on it. Then I'll try to let them walk it just like as if it was a stage several times to kind of get the process because a lot of these guys 
especially level one guys that have never had any class, they don't they don't really understand that we should be thinking about why are we stepping out with this foot? Why are we stepping mm -hmm. in with this foot? What's this foot doing? There's just so many things they're not thinking about. They just kind of randomly pick up their feet and go from one place to the other place and then randomly put their feet down again. And, and that usually shows when they run a stage because then they'll randomly come into some sort of position. Then you'll see the guys that'll like stop here and they'll shoot. And then the next thing, they do something way over like that to lean because they're out of position. So that's my whole process there is, is, is why are we going from A to B? And why are we not thinking about what our feet are doing? So, you know, we'll talk about it and demo it and let them work through it. And then they'll run it a few times. And then I'll say, okay, did you know what you did? That's usually my big question. Do you know what you did? Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, I did this. And I'll say, and you did, you know, you you're, you crossed your feet, you stepped wrong, you were balancing on one foot instead of being planted or whatever the process is. But trying to make them start, you know, because I can coach you all day long, but until you start processing it yourself and able to run something yourself and go, Phew, I know what I did. Let's back that up and let's try that again and do it right. Even yep. if I got to turn the dial down and slow it up a little bit. And even, so even before we ran this, uh, I actually wrote down what I was going to focus on. Um, and it ended up being pretty close for, for the most part. Uh, some things were a little off, uh, but on the movement. So my focus is stepping off with the correct foot and creating easy entries and exits where they're available, which for these, for those targets, they're not really hard exits, uh, just because they're not like hardcover or it's a it's a full target orientation. Yeah. All right, so tell me the difference between a hard and a soft. So hard and easy. Yeah, hard, hard and easy. Hard and easy. Okay. Hard and easy. So there's th when when we let's just look at position one, position two. We have one exit and one entrance. Depending upon the target, if it's a hard target, a piece of steel at distance, a partial, a no shoot, a head only, if it's a hard target, it literally becomes a hard exit, meaning we have to give our full attention to making two good sh shots onto that target before we decide to leave. If it's a easy exit, that means it's a wide open target or it's a really close target or it's a target that we feel we can make two good shots on pretty quickly and while we're making those shots begin our exit so and there's lots of different versions of how we can begin that exit but you know usually the one thing is just you know fire around and then start picking up your foot and starting the exit process firing that second round and that's what exactly what so what you did today so like whenever you've got your left and right targets once you so you've shot one round at that left target. You know after the second round you need to begin that movement. That's exactly what bleeding off is. Is, exactly is. you go bang, you pick that lead foot up, you get it ready, and you can even take that shot with that foot in the air or just as it's coming off the ground. That's exactly what that is. Yeah, because it's legal as long as it's not yeah. touching outside. Correct. Correct. And, th and this particular drill is box to box, and I've kind of – evolved away from boxes because we just don't shoot in boxes very often mm -hmm. if they do it's a classifier but the boxes give us that very defined space so that we can start to understand that process and then we take those boxes away and then we still have the same process but we don't have foot faults in the way but you know the whole thought thought is is anytime you can do two things at once it's, mm -hmm. it's always almost always faster and so the thought process there is I can begin to go that way while I'm shooting two rounds over here so I'm a half a step or a step ahead of the next guy that's shooting against me. If he doesn't do that, yeah. If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't do it correctly. Or if he gets in a hurry and does it faster but throws a D and I threw two A's. Or okay. Mm -hmm. So you have a hard or easy target you're leaving, and then you have a hard or easy target Correct, yeah. you're moving to. And the exact same thing into an, into an entry position is if it's easy, we can start shooting a whole lot sooner. If it's a hard, again, partial, steel, whatever, that's a hard entry. We need to be a little bit more planted so that we set. can make yeah. those good shots. And that's everybody's skill level. You know, my skill level on a on a hard is a little bit different than your skill. Level. You know, Max's is a whole lot different than all of us. But it, it's all your skill level as to what you feel you can comfortably make those shots at. Mm -hmm. And the sooner you can start making them, again, that's just time on the clock. You're taken away from your competitor. 
But for this drill, both of these would be considered easy. Yeah. Correct. Easy entries and exits. Correct. Yeah. And the nice thing about that drill, four yards is really easy. Ten yards is kind of on that borderline, even for a, for a more experienced shooter, especially that we're exiting a turn away from it. So it's off on our right, which means we're exiting to our left, which means we've got to be kind of cockeyed a little bit on the exit. So that 10-yard target, even though it's a wide open and a fairly easy target, it's one you really can't take for granted. And I would not make it, I'd still make it probably an easier exit, but I certainly wouldn't make it as easy as the four-yard target, mm -hmm. even though they're both wide open. And so, like, for me specifically, it seems like, and just something that I've noticed, is my shots after, so whether that, and it kind of makes a little bit of difference, not really, and it's just something that I've noticed that I need to work on. It doesn't really matter if it's a close or far target. I have better hits after my draw than I do after a movement. Even though, you know, technically I'm still in that position too in the in the draw cycle, but it seems like I've drilled my draw so many times that I'm more accurate going from here to here, then, you know, I'm already here, and I just have to do this. Right. Uh, my shots on paper are better after my draw. Not necessarily faster, but they're more accurate. Um, and we saw that today just because it didn't matter which side I started on. I had, you know, maybe one or two less Charlies on whatever side that I drew from than the, the movement side at the end of the transition. Um, and that's just something that I need to work on. And that's probably because I think that I, kind of like what I was telling you, I think that I suck real far in whenever I'm moving, whether it's doesn't matter, left to right, right to left, instead of keeping it, I kind of just call this my workspace. I think you call it the happy place. Happy or, place. It's, where, uh, it's where our hands work. It's where you reload. It's where you move. It's where we um, applaud. Yeah. It's just. When your competitor throws a mic, <laughs> that's where we <laughs> applaud. <laughs> instead of coming all the way in, I just need to work on basically recreating that position too. Yeah. So in the draw cycle, uh, like what we would go over in what you would go over in like the level one class. Uh, so you've got position one, two, and then you know three, and uh, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And so my position two, need, I need to be able to recreate that. And so wherever I'm at after my draw, once I'm moving, I need to be in that same space, not closer or farther or whatever, whenever, same thing when I'm reloading, I need to be able to recreate that position because that seems to me like an easier acquisition right. after whatever work I'm doing. Well, and part of it is that this sport is points divided by time. Mm. And so we always have that clock in our head, so we always think we have to go faster. And so a lot of times that is not necessarily that you're coming, say, from position two incorrectly. It's that you're coming from position two and then you're not having that little bit of visual patience to get that dot back where it should be, yeah. you know, just not having that. Yeah, and I do that real bad. Two tenths of a, of a, of a <laughs> bit of a patience to go, okay, my, I don't see my dot. I'm not going to squeeze two rounds off because I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. Well, my Especially at an open target. <laughs> Usually if it's a yeah. partial, people go, whoa, easy does really it. Need yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if it's a wide open target, people are just like, bip, bip, bip. You know, especially with a trigger finger like his. They, ju you know, they just don't have that <laughs> patience to let it settle for just that little tiny, 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 tiny bit longer. Yeah to see a good sight picture and so like that would be and so i'll read off what i what i would focus on mm -hmm. and then you uh you tell me what you focused on because it's okay. probably it's probably not the same things uh so mine uh the main thing is stepping off with the correct foot and stepping so stepping out of the first box and into the second box with the correct foot with the lead foot that was the main thing that i wanted to to focus on because I know that I struggle with that. Spe not so much stepping out, but I know that when I step in, I'm always, something is off. Either I've gone too far into the box or I stepped in with the wrong foot or whatever. Well, if you remember um, going from the left box to the right, or other way around, right box to the yeah. left, every time you ran that drill, you stepped with the wrong foot. Yeah, I stepped in. in. You went correct going the other yeah. direction, but coming back that other direction, we can revert. Yeah, so that was my main thing. And then uh, the second thing was um, uh, focusing on that easy exit. And so 
that's something that I sh- that I know that I struggled with whenever I was in his level one class is that that space between the shot and the step. I'm trying to shoot in that space, like on purpose, because I don't want to shoot too late because then I'm out of the box and that's procedural. Or, you know, if if you shoot both too soon before you take that step, then that may be time that you're missing. May not be a lot of time, but I'm trying to be cognitive of that specifically is bang, lift my foot, bang, and then take that step. And so that was those were the two main things. Um, so once we set it up and you kind of saw how you have to run it, mm-hmm. what did you focus on? For me, okay, so moving to the right, Blake explained for him the most efficient way. If we're moving to the right, then we lead with our right foot. So that, that was something I had to concentrate on to make sure that I wasn't turning and everything. And I know that I want to get to where, <coughs> like you, I'm picking my foot up yeah. and let, but I – Honestly, I hadn't. Even, I haven't got that far down the road yet. I, that'll be the next step. But I was concentrating on, because I'm still, honestly, still working on my draw, uh, which Blake helped me out a lot. So I, my thing is, I'm thinking, all right, find the dot, shoot twice, lead with the right foot, and then after that, probably what 90% of my concentration was on was where, because going to the right, I want to enter with my right foot foot yep. into that box so i'm trying to figure out where i'm going to put my left foot so that i can do that properly and i was honestly i was i worked on stutter stepping to get that in the right and then i kind of hopped a couple of times and yep. took really long steps to yep. try to get my left foot in the correct spot and that's that's what he was saying and that's i think why i struggled so much in that first class is because that shorter distance that shorter how the shorter the movement is between like box A and box B, the more difficult it is. Yep. Because you may not get that exact same positioning every time you do it. So most time you do have some sort of stutter step in there. And for me, I think it's because I don't really focus on that lead foot. I focus on the plant mm-hmm. foot, which would be, you know, the weak be, the weak So going side to the foot. right, your left foot. Yeah. And so as long as I get that plant because you kind of have to kick it off to orient towards the target and then so whenever you step in you just have to move it like right over the barrier or wherever yeah. the box is it's a very small movement um, so I kind of tend to focus more on the plant foot than the lead foot but as long as I remember yes. which one I've got to start off on mm-hmm. it usually kind of not going to the left obviously but right going Correct. to the right well I think the other thing that Blake pointed out for me too was to make sure when okay get like you say, your the the plant foot be my left foot right next to the box, yep. and then step deep into that box. For you, right yeah, foot. more so because you got real long legs, yep. yeah. and so you need more space. Like for me, I can fit both my feet in like this big of a space, but you just need a little more space because your because your base <laughs> is is wider. Yeah. <laughs> now you're just bragging. <laughs> um, but and s- but that just kind of goes into to your thing. You know, everybody has their physical things that they're able to do and it's not the same well i mean i've coached from from new shooters that are in their young 20s to new shooters that were ladies that were in their 60s and and everybody has their own yeah their own personal issues to deal with whether it's a longer step taller guys shorter guys yeah. bad hip bad back bad knees i mean i've had uh, i've coached some guys one time and you know my, my thing is for a right-handed shooter, the right-handed, the right foot should be back just a little bit. And I coached some guys one time, and their feet were backwards. And I said, "Okay, let's talk about your stance real quick." And they said, "Wait a minute, before you go too far on that, this we teach fencing." Yeah. And this is our name, normal stance for fencing. And, and okay, but we're not fencing, so okay, <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> well, it would probably be the same for like a, a cross-eyed dominant person, or or something along those lines. Yeah. Or, guess, or me coaching a left-handed shooter would be yeah. a challenge just because everything look, looks so it's backwards. Mirrored, it's, yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of hard to get a grasp and wrap your head around. Wait a minute. Okay. Let's think about that draw stroke. Okay, it was correct, even though their hands are in the weird position. But So that was what I was concentrating on the first time. And then I realized everywhere I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and so then the next time, because one of the things I did, which, which Blake helped me with, um, 
I knew something was wrong. I didn't know exactly what it was. But it was good to have Blake's insight into seeing, actually seeing it in his experience to point out, okay, here's what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I, I got in my shooter stance. I, draw and sh I drew and shot the first target, and I'm down in the athletic position. I turned and moved. When I turned and moved, I stood up. Yeah. I went up straight, and then when I got into the second box, I turned, I shot, and like I shoot once, and, and I realize, <laughs> and then I realize, oh shoot, you got to get down. So then you drop down. Well, then you drop down. Like Blake said, I dropped down 18 yeah. inches. So it's like boom, boom. I hit yeah. top, I hit, I hit yeah. shot, yeah. growing shot. Well, it's like <laughs> it's like the coach that saw you do something wrong, so he blows the whistle and says drop, <laughs> and so you you know you get down in the athletic position. Um, that's something. Staying low is something that I also, it's kind of in the back of my mind. Obviously, I don't have to, I don't have a big as difference as you, um, but you would probably, like, contribute that to, like, football or baseball or whatever. Like I was telling Blake, I contribute mine more to band because I was in band for, like, 10 years, and we do a lot of footwork. Yep. And so going, not necessarily on the drill we did today, because you're not shooting between those positions, uh, but you have to work a lot on pivoting your feet towards the, your direction of travel mm -hmm. while your body is still oriented towards a target. Yeah. And so you're always going to be like this, or just like when you said, when you plant that foot, it's facing forward. Yeah. Not just to be next to the box, but because it's facing the target. And so then you just kind of roll around and orient your body towards the target. But band, that's the first thing my mind goes to. I'm like, we worked on this in band because <laughs> we had to roll our feet because if you transfer that to the shooting world, what does that do? That keeps your dot from bouncing around because mm -hmm. you're, you're smooth in your steps, and so it's a lot smoother. Well, you break that down even more. If I'm standing straight up like a board, it doesn't matter how I'm rolling my feet. I'm going to be doing this. So then you have to get low. And I've had multiple matches where it's mostly on steel. I'll get a couple misses. And the first thing I do before I try to fix anything with my grip or my stance or whatever, I get lower. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I do is I just get a little bit lower, and I usually get a hit yeah. right after I do that. All right, there you go. There's your plug, all you high school age <laughs> people. Band. Be in the marching band yeah. to learn how to do good footwork. I was not in the marching band. Yeah. I was Honestly, my, um, I got all my heights when I got into between my seventh grade and my eighth grade year. Wow. And I was a – looked like a Basketball baby. Star. Yeah, baby draft. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I remember, though, how – I remember I had a – we were warming up for a basketball game, and I had gum, and my coach brought me over, and he says, spit out that gum. And I said, Why? He said, you can barely walk and dribble the ball. There ain't no way you can chew gum <laughs> and walk and dribble. <laughs> and he was funny. serious as a heart attack. <laughs> but that's that's one thing that helped me uh, specifically for the, the movement and the footwork aspect of it. Um, the sports side of it goes into, like, the stutter steps. So in that little short distance, yep. you are probably going to have a stutter step somewhere in there. So those little quick quick foot movements band's not going to help you with that because there's right. no quick movements in band um so that's kind of where the sports aspect comes into it but a lot of this carries over to something that like you or i did in high school or what blake did in high school that built those foundations and now we are seeing them come back as to something that we need to iterate into this sport uh well, then the other thing that threw me off on it is like, all right, I got this down. We're gonna, I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna shoot two at this one. I'm gonna move to my right. I'm gonna leave with my right foot. I'm gonna enter with my right foot, and I'm gonna shoot those two. So I'm like, all right, I done it, did it. All right, this is good. Okay, now let's do it to the left. Oh crap! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait <laughs> That's right. I don't do anything good with my left hand. So, th and then honestly, that was for me, at least mentally. When I do anything to the left, it seems more difficult. Yeah. Well, I think um, – I don't remember if you told me that. It's more – it's for right-handed shooters, that is natural, shooting left to right. It's just a more natural – It's also safer for us if we yeah. have to reload. The, the gun's already because kind of downrange. 
Whereas yeah. if we're going to our left, to our left, it's uh, it's closer to that 180. Yeah. Okay. And so as a as a rule of thumb, if if I have a choice, I will generally move from left to right. But one of the things I say lately is, you know, there's what I want to do and there's what a match director allows me to do. So, yeah. I, you know, it's always good to practice things, even though, especially if we're not good at them or if we struggle yes. with them, to, to practice on those. You know, a lot of guys will go out there and they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm the king of the world on, on, on the bill drill. I run that all day long. And ah, that's really good. That's awesome. 17 splits, 16 splits, 13 splits, whatever. That's awesome. But what, what can you do, you know, on a stage? Yeah. And so practicing those things we're not good at is where we start. Right. Another thing I think I learned today doing this, I'm going through a lot of education, so I'm used to studying, looking at books, learning how to do these things. But, and so I think, all right, I can do that. You've given me this drill. I can go work on that drill and get better. But just having Blake's eye there going, oh, well, you're doing this with, I mean, because he fixed yeah. my draw with like, just by watching the video. Something that me. you wouldn't notice. <laughs> Something that yeah. I didn't even know. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm working on my draw. I'm trying to get faster, but I never can find my dot. And Blake says, well, it's because you're drawing wrong. You're doing like do this. And I was like, <laughs> practice it 10 times. Holy crap. That's a lot yeah, better. Yeah, way better. That's that's <laughs> way, way better. So, I mean, I can't iterate. I know it's good to do this, but get with Blake at 415training.com and let him work with you because he, he can save you so much time. Because I've been working on that since day one. Mm -hmm. How many months have I been wasting that he fixed in two well, if, seconds? If you don't know what – what you're needing to fix or how to fix it, then it doesn't matter how many times you do it, you're going to be doing it wrong. Well, in that part that is, I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even realize it was wrong. Right. I was just trying to keep trying to make it faster. Yeah. I was doing the wrong way. Let's make it faster, 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 yeah. faster. Well, and that comes and, in. And I just kept thinking it, it's because you hadn't practiced enough. Yeah, and that comes into what's natural and what's efficient. Yeah, and that's what we all. That's what I would say is, as soon as I do something wrong, I revert to what feels right. it feels natural but it may not be as efficient as what i'm supposed to be doing and so that's why you have to really pound these things in so that your what you're reverting back to when something goes wrong is still the correct thing so all that you have to build up that foundation okay. for the fundamentals not before you start comp compounding but you can't stop doing them once you start adding new things that doesn't mean you can stop doing those first four things because now we're working on 10 things right. instead of four but it, it doesn't <laughs> mean 20. it doesn't mean just work on those new six things you still have to work those first four yep. and yep. it all just compounds and builds on top of each other it's like building a house yeah yep. you know you start with the foundation and then you can kind of move up to the walls but if you kind of skimp around on those first steps then as soon yep. as something happens it's all going to crash down so in your classes how many le – you've got level one classes, level two classes. So I've got level one, and level one has remained almost the exact same as the day I created it. Okay. Uh, I've got multiple versions of level two. Um, and they kind of progress. They kind of get a little bit harder. It's almost like you say level two, three, four, and five, but they all still revolve around the concepts of level two. And then I have an advanced class, and I've done that a few times – and I'm still working on that one. Okay. Level two, I really want, level three, I really want it to be building a stage one drill at a time. And the few times I've done it, it hasn't really worked out like I thought it would. Okay. It, it hasn't really well, I, I can see how the two can, we could spend years. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Well, I mean, because we're, we're just human and all we can do is, is just do the best we can do on something and just keep trying to practice and get better at it. And, and. It's it's not an easy sport. It's a very difficult sport to be really good at it. It takes a lot of rounds downrange, and it takes a lot of dedication to it, and it takes a lot of practice, and it takes a lot of saying, I really don't, that doesn't feel right, but I know it's better, so yeah. I'm going to erase the bad stuff, and I'm going to try to do the right way, and, and it takes a lot of self-reflective going, even me in practice, you know, a lot of days I'll be out there in practice, and I'll do something, and I'm like. Well, that's, that's funny that you said that because – so whenever we were in, uh, well, you were there we, in in Rosenberg. Oh, no, you had to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, so in my squad, uh, Luigi, I've talked about him a couple times. Mm -hmm. He was in my squad. He's actually an SV sponsored shooter now. Good he's for a, him. He's a fantastic shooter. Yeah. Well, for this particular stage, JJ Ricasa had come over to watch us, and Luigi, he just happened to get a reshoot, 
I don't remember what the deal was. It was something with a barrel or, or something like that. We well, got a reshoot. Well, JJ had already – he hadn't watched the first run, but somebody had videoed it. And so he was like, hey, let, let me see that. And so he showed him, and he was like, oh, dude, why are you doing that? And, he's, and this is already – like, it's two pros talking <laughs> to each other. But – and it's mostly just because Luigi was shooting, I think, carry optics, and JJ shoots open. Or I might have been limited for that match. Uh, but anyway, they're shooting two different classes. They're both professionals in, in what they do. But even talking to each other, there's differences in what they do. And so JJ was like, dude, just try this. Like, it, I, I think you can shave like two or three seconds off your time. And Luigi was like, no, dude, that's going to feel terrible. Like, it's, that goes against everything that I do naturally that feels right. And he just begged him. He was like, please just try it. Like, just trust me on this. Well, he did it. Sure enough, his time was like five or six seconds slower. But what Fa- stuck. Fa- faster. Yeah, it was faster. Uh, but what stuck in my mind is, and you can find mm-hmm. it on his on his Instagram, at the end of the video, JJ goes, how did that feel? And he goes, it felt terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it anyway, and it worked. And now I think that was JJ's whole point is, you know, you have to go against what feels correct if you want to kind of push that envelope yeah. to yep. improvement. And that just kind of made me laugh because that was the first thing he, he asked him. He was like, how did that feel? He's like, it felt awful. <laughs> well, well, you got to go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I've got a guy that I'm working with out of the Metroplex right now, and um, he was actually in band quite a bit. So he has some of those core footwork drills too. There you go, man. Band nerds are awesome But shooters. when you do things – you know, he's making a pretty good shooter. I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. He's he, he knows who I'm talking about if he's listening to this. Um but I know whenever we were starting the entries and exits, he struggled with that lead foot going out. And there's there's reasons behind all of this, or at least there's my reasons behind all of this. Um and he struggled with that for a while till he finally got it down and you know, well, and that's one of the things he'd say, he's like, That just doesn't feel natural. I struggled I with it. There's not a reason. <laughs> Because I'm the opposite. Like, you were talking about how you you want to be able to study something, you mm-hmm. know, over and over until it, it's perfected. If I don't – if I can't make myself realize the reason behind it, it doesn't matter if he tells me why or if you tell me why. I'm just not going to – like, I know comprende. <laughs> and so it took me actually seeing it or feeling it whether it felt right or wrong, I was able to see the difference. And so then, it, until that happens, it doesn't stick. But it's like I have this, like, you aha. Have, you have, yeah, you have to have that aha yeah, moment. Yeah, it's like an aha moment where once it's in, then you're never going to forget it yeah. because you see it, yeah. and it's just or or, or when you actually do it and understand, okay, that I, yeah. I understand now why this is better because I've been running it the wrong way and my time was this and my hits were this and I ran it the right way one time mm-hmm. and my time went whoop and my hits went better and, you know, yeah. whatever that aha moment is. But So as a – I got one, one more question yeah, for yeah, you. That's what I'm here for. As, as a GM, yeah. so I talked about what I focused on mm-hmm. for this drill once we added movement. And then what Dan focused on. As somebody who, I mean, I don't, you probably drilled the fundamentals for years up to this point. What would you focus on on this stage? For me, I mean, for me to, 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 to try to play at the level that I'm trying to play at, and I say trying to play at the level I'm trying to play at. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting directly against Silder, and I'm shooting directly against Max when he's at open, and, and I know I'm not at those guys' league, but I'm, still shoot directly against them. Um, so for me, when I focus on those things, I'm, I'm really trying to focus on every single piece of it. I'm mm-hmm. trying to focus on a good draw stroke. I'm trying to focus on two good rounds on paper. I'm trying to focus on exiting as soon as I can, whether it's a hard or whether it's an easy. I'm trying to focus on that footwork across, and then I'm trying to focus on my entry and then repeating the process in the other box. I mean, I really try to focus on all of it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me, though, because you've got that set to where you can do that. Yeah. As us well, being new, we have to do now that. Now you just yeah. have to. Well, and, and, and I was yeah. going to say, it, a, a big part of that is starting out in level one, let's just say yeah. class, and getting those fundamentals and then just beating those fundamentals repeatedly until they start becoming secondary. Now, once yeah. they become secondary nature, they're just habit. 
then it's not like I really have to, I don't have to think about my exit anymore. I, I know my exit's going to be there. I mean, almost always. There's always tricks that match directors do, and they make you, oh, crap, I exited wrong on that one. But there's always, but it's always there in my core, and I don't ever really have to say exit. Okay. I don't have to really say plant this foot to enter here. It, it's built in. You but just do that, it, yeah. It's, it's kind of secondary nature now, but that doesn't mean I'm not thinking about it, and it doesn't mean I'm not programming things like that in continually in walkthroughs and visualizations. It's like speed reading. When you start to learn how to read, you learn to read one word at a time. As you get to be a better reader, you get you get to where, whether you realize it or not, you're looking at more than one word at a time. Mm -hmm. Speed readers look at an entire line at a time, and then they look at an entire paragraph at a time, and that's how mm -hmm. they're able. They just see it all, and that's kind of the same thing. Yeah, it, yeah. With him being a GM and having all this experience, he's able to just focus on the whole thing, things yeah. rather than we're, me and you are still trying to focus on one thing. Well, and you and you said that right there. It is experience. There's a whole lot of this game. I mean, a, a good friend of mine out of the Metroplex played D1 football. He's incredibly – not out of Metroplex, out of Midland, Odessa. You know, I'm I talking know about – I you're talking about. <laughs> um, I don't know if we can say his name. I don't want to give too much of a shout-out on him, you know. He's got a big enough hit anyway. <laughs> um, incredibly athletic dude. Super athletic dude. But – there's a certain amount of this game that really is experience, knowing what to do, when to do it, why you're doing it, you know, and all that experience builds into your capabilities. That helps if you have that it, yeah, if, yeah, if you have that, yeah. if you have D1 caliber of athletic abilities, you're ahead of most of us already yeah. just because yeah. of that. Uh, kind of like J.J. Rakaza. J.J. Rakaza, if he shot deltas all day long, he's still going to beat most of us <laughs> because he's so physically fit and so athletic. Yeah. But if you take that same athleticism and now you build a whole lot of experience on that and they understand the visual patience in two rounds actually and in two, two alphas, et cetera, et cetera, yep. and then, then your game just goes. Yeah. All right, well, very good. Well, we sure appreciate you coming over and spending time with Always us today. Always a pleasure. And be sure and tune in. In a, in a month, we'll have him back, and he's going to bring in. We're going to build on that drill, add a little more onto it, and, uh, and get that rocking. So tune in to that one. That'll be epic. Uh, the podcast episode after next. All right. Well, that kind of wraps up uh, our episode for today. Previewing next episode in about two weeks, we're going to have uh, Gene Bucky's come from. He's uh, NBRSA Hall of Fame member, which is a National Benchrest uh, Shooting Association, big time centerfire uh, benchrest guru. Really, really want actually. We don't want to blow up his ego well, more he, than it already is. He's, but he's, like, one, he's literally one of the best in the world. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Nice. For, for centerfire benchrest, he's. I mean, he's always on the national yeah. team. They go in Africa or wherever they're wow. going to go compete. But and he lives in Eden, Texas, just down the road here. He'd, re he'd retired. He worked. Wow. Um, they retired. His daughter lived there, and he moved out here just a few years ago. But we've gotten to be good friends with him. He's doing a little rimfire benchrest. But anyway, he's going to come over and talk to us a little bit about getting started in for new folks wanting to go into centerfire bench rest. And then we'll uh, finish off with bleeding off with Joseph, and he's going to talk a little bit more about transitions. Maybe we'll have some matches we can talk about. By yes, then. we'll have a few little match results. <laughs> Probably not Hopefully by some that more time, on the schedule. After, yeah. We'll definitely have more on the schedule. All right, so be sure and go look at our new website. Uh, www.straightshootingwithdanandjoseph. You can email us, host at Dan and Joseph or host at Straight Shooting with yeah. Dan and Joseph .com. Uh, Look at our YouTube channel, Straight Shooting Podcast. You can get those on there. We'll have the on our website as well. We'll have the PDFs of these new drills, the stage set up for those. So to, uh, tune and in the website, that website is a good. It has every platform yes. basically that we are on. So that's kind of your one stop shop. If you want to see us, you can go to YouTube from there, or you can just go straight to YouTube. Or if you just want to listen to us, because I know we're kind of ugly, <laughs> just find our audio <laughs> shows on the website. All right, there we go. Blake, thank you once again. Thank you all. Appreciate everyone listening. Be sure to uh, like us and follow us on the podcast channels that you're on. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>